Hi and welcome to another English language A-level video with me Paul from the QE here at Downington and this one is another language change video and it's about words coming into the language and words disappearing from the language. Okay so let's have a think about early modern English loan words. Now let's get the time frame right when we're talking about early modern English we're talking about kind of 1500 to around about 1650. So this is the Renaissance period, uh, so-called because it's kind of like the rebirth of learning and education. And um, what you're getting in English language at this time is beginnings of a whole lot of borrowing. So lots of loan words coming into the language from all sorts of different languages. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a whole load of words that came in to English in this Renaissance period between 1500 and 1650. And of course, guess what? What you need to do is that you need to be matching the word on the left with the language on the right. OK, so pause the video there and have a go at doing this matching exercise. OK, I'm assuming that you've done that. So let's go down the list on the left hand side and then link it up with these languages in blue on the right. First of all, we have caravan. Now, caravan comes from Persian. Persian being the language of modern day Iran over there. So this demonstrates the importance of trade, growing trade links and the opening up of the so-called Silk Road. OK, so here we've got destinations in the Middle East, which are suddenly becoming part of a European trade route. And that's why we've got a word like caravan coming into the English language at this time. Our second word is encyclopedia. This is a word that comes from ancient Greek. OK, so it's so one of these words that's associated with knowledge and culture. And so many of those words we draw upon the classical languages. Um, for those for the terms. <clears throat> Our third word is troll. Now troll comes from Old Norse. It's one of those old Scandinavian words. So it's a Norwegian word. And I suppose it shows the importance of the oral tradition. It's one of these words that's handed down from generation to generation. And it's part of the storytelling culture of Scandinavia. Expectation is a word that comes from Latin. So it's one of those hosts of abstract polysyllabic bits of Lexis where um, it's formed by the process of affixing where you've got the word expect and then it's been made it's been nominalized by putting a T I O N on the end. So it demonstrates the process of affixing and it's one of many, many, many words that are coming in to English in the Renaissance period from Latin. Yacht. It's quite interesting because that comes from Dutch and so perhaps it demonstrates the importance of um, the Netherlands uh, with, with its developed navigation going across the world. So at that time, lots of words from Dutch that are to do with maritime affairs, they come into English as well, I hear, to do with some of our naughtiest swear words as well. So it's the Dutch who are blamed, like Dutch sailors who are blamed for the intrusion of these words. Hmm. Not quite sure whether that's to be believed or not. We have bamboo, which comes from Malay, my current day Malaysia. So this really demonstrates the breadth of travel that's going on. I think, again, it's linked to uh, Dutch adventures across in Far East Asia. And so that word ends up in English um, as a result. Flannel's interesting because flannel's from Welsh. OK, and there are just a handful of words that seem to make their way into English from Welsh, which maybe is something of a surprise. You know, uh, a group of people, the Welsh, who are there, you know, on this particular island that seem to have contributed so little in the way of English. So what that demonstrates is that borrowing is often about power and languages don't tend to borrow from other languages which are perceived as having kind of low low status, low prestige. We have the word guru. Now, guru comes from Hindi. OK, so this demonstrates the importance of colonisation, obviously the development of the, uh, the British Empire 
in the early 18th and 19th century. So we're starting to borrow words from the wealth of different Indian languages. We then have moustache, which is from French, and we've ransacked French for all sorts of words from different semantic fields, um, here to do with male grooming and appearance. We have apricot. Apricot comes from either Portuguese or Spanish. So again, it shows the importance of trading at this time. It's obviously not a fruit which could have been grown in England at the time. So it shows that with navigational progress happening, that means that you've got increased trade with southern states like Mediterranean states. We have the word opera. Opera comes from Italian and it's a host of words that come in in the Renaissance period from Italian. Remember what I said about we tend to borrow from powers that are socially, politically, financially powerful. Well, the Italian states would have fitted the bill at the time. Think of, for example, Shakespeare's plays, which are predominantly set in Italian states. So opera comes from Italian. We have chic, or sheik, which comes from Arabic. So again, shows development of links with the Middle East. We have mosquito, which comes from either Spanish or Portuguese. And then we have trousers, which comes from Irish. Okay, so it's worthwhile remembering some of those as examples of early modern English loan words and how and why they might have come into the language in that particular period, 1500 to 1650. Okay, so um, in our uh, booklet that we use on this course, I've uh, printed uh, an article from the internet written by Philip Durkin, who's the Dep Deputy Chief Editor of the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, and he's written an article entitled, Does English Still Borrow from Other Languages? And it goes like this, or the beginning goes like this, English language has borrowed words for centuries but it's now lending more than it's taking, asks Philip Turkin, Deputy Chief Editor of the OED. English speakers may not be famous for being au fait with foreign languages, but all of us use words from other languages every day. In that last sentence, au fait is an obvious example, but famous foreign languages use and taken are also borrowed words. Knowledge of what is being borrowed and from where provides an invaluable insight into the international relations of the English language. And it's a really good article there about borrowing. So let's just go through some of, some of the ideas that I've handpicked from the article. He argues, so this is Philip Durkin, he's arguing that some, some lexis, some words, builds up in frequency. And to support that, he takes the word sushi, now, you might have thought, well, the word sushi, that's a, quite a recent uh, neologism. You know, there weren't that many people eating Japanese food, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago. But actually, it was first recorded over 130 years ago. So the 1890s was when the word sushi was first being used in English. So there are many, many words like that, which their first utterances was a long, long time ago. And those words kind of build up in frequency. The second point that he, he makes is that each speaker of a language does have a slightly different kind of vocabulary. That if, for example, you are a New Zealand speaker of English, that you will have a set of words there which are different to British English. Aroha, for example, meaning sympathy or understanding, presumably coming from a Maori language. Okay. And David Crystal makes the same point when he's been to uh, South Africa and he talks with South Africans about the, the number of South African English words that there are, which he num numbers as 30,000. So every speaker of a language does have a slightly different vocabulary. Now, in terms of the balance of taking and borrowing and lending, uh, what Philip Durkin is arguing is that the balance is tipping much more towards English as a donor of new words rather than a borrower. OK, so if you think of words like Internet or computer or cell phone or meeting or business, these are ubiquitous words which pop up in all sorts of languages across the world. 
So English is our kind of main scale donor of new words to other languages. He also goes back in time to the Middle Ages and he thinks about the everyday vocabulary of English in the Middle Ages and how deeply it was affected by borrowing from other languages. And he gives the example of the following words, age, air, cause, city, idea, join, material, poor, suffer, tax. All of those, they all come from either French or Latin. And so he argues that, well, nearly half of the 1,000 most frequently occurring words in current day written English they come from French or Latin, mostly in the medieval period from 1066 to 1500. OK, so borrowing is tremendously important from particular languages in particular eras. Uh, the other thing he states is that we have many words that come in from Scandinavian languages, which have had a very, very strong impact on our everyday language. I mean, we're talking about the kind of bread and butter lexis of the language, words like give, take, hit, leg, skin, sky, even the pronoun they, those all come from Old Norse. Okay, so they're very basic fundamental parts of the language which come from Old Norse. The other point that he makes is that close contact does not inevitably lead to borrowing. And he gives us an example of some of the words that we did in the previous exercise, words like trousers, coming from Irish, or go or clan. There's some of a, a tiny number of words which are dot borrowed from Celtic languages. And again, the point that I'd make there is about power. We tend to borrow from languages or cultures which we perceive to be powerful in some way, rather than those cultures which are invaded or their power has been taken from them. So finally, patterns of borrowed words, they do reflect very complex patterns of cultural contacts across the centuries. It's a fascinating area of the development of the lexicon. OK, now it's not just words that are coming into the language. We also have this phenomena of archaisms, i.e. words becoming more and more outdated so that they actually disappear out of the language. So it's a two way process that goes on there. I'm going to give you five words here and I want you to look at them, look in the context of the sentence and I want you to guess, well, what do these words actually mean? So we have alienism, we have Sharaban, we have cyclogyro, we have wickle and we have stereoscope. All of these are outdated archaisms. What do you think they originally meant? Here are some sentences. In spite of her friendly sympathy, he never felt so keenly his alienism as in her presence. The afternoon was generally given up to some excursion or charabang drive, and the day finished rather somnolently in the lounge. He stepped into the cyclogyro, and within ten minutes they were away. A whittle, a barber, and a bald-headed man <coughs> travelled together. When you put your eyes to the peephole, it was like looking through a stereoscope. OK, so pause the video there and think, well, try and be a lexicographer and define these words. Right, let's have a look at the actual meanings of them. So let's go back to alienism. Now, alienism is the study and treatment of mental illness. There are lots of words that have to do with mental illness which have changed over time because public sensibilities and sensitivities have changed about these things. For example, people with mental illnesses in the 19th century were described in textbooks as being cretins. So alienism is another good example of this where we don't tend to think of people with these ailments as we don't want to talk about them as being alien in some way. So some of it, I mean, you could call that political correctness, although political correctness is a bit of a pejorative word that's been used to criticise things. Surely it's a good thing that we are more sensitive about the word, the labels that we pin on people about their illnesses. So alienism, the study and treatment of mental illnesses. Sharabang is a motor 
coach. It's a motor coach that looks like that. So it's an open air, enormous coach. Okay, so if you were in in Edwardian uh, London, or uh, kind of early Georgian London, I should say, in the 1910s and the 1920s, you had to be careful because you didn't want to get run over by a Sharaban. So this shows the development of technology, isn't it? That we have new inventions, uh, and for a while these are very, very important elements in society. And then when uh, new bits of technology come across, like the omnibus, meaning the bus, then the Sharabang is no more. We have a cyclogyro, which is a type of aircraft propelled by rotating blades. So there it is, a cyclogyro, a type of aircraft propelled by rotating blades. So we can bracket that in the same way as Sharabang. So this was vehicular uh, technology. It was very important at one time, but had a very short shelf life. Whittle. Now, Whittle is interesting. A man who tolerates his wife's infidelity. Whittle. It's a bit like Shakespearean cuckolds, which meant the same thing. So interesting to think, well, why would a word like that have disappeared? Presumably, there are still men who tolerate their wives' infidelity. So why is it that that word has disappeared? And then finally, we've got the stereoscope, which is a device for looking at two things simultaneously. And there's what it looks like. So that one, that one, and that one are good examples of how technology changes, and therefore some of the words are superseded and then become archaic, outdated things. So what I'd say to you is, uh, on from this video, have a look out for other borrowed words, words that have come into the language or are coming into the language from other languages. And try and think how and why. Why has English taken those words? Why have they come into the language? What are the kind of social external factors that means that the English has loaned those words? And secondly, try and think of other words which you think have disappeared out of the language. So particularly if you're something like a, a literature student, who was studying older texts, like for example, John Milton's Paradise Lost, or a play by Shakespeare, undoubtedly you'll be coming across words which are unfamiliar to you. And some of them are archaisms. So why have those particular words disappeared out of the language? Okay, thanks very much.